Bom dia. Buenos dias. Good morning. Bonjour. I'm very honored and thrilled to be here today in the beautiful city of uh, Rio de Janeiro. Actually, it is my, uh, one of it's my hate or nose love city, in, at least in my life so far. I have a three cities which I love, which is Rio de Janeiro, Cape Town, and Sydney. But Rio is for me is number one in here, so it's like my first love. Ladies and gentlemen, please do be guest. Uh, it is my utmost pleasure to speak before you today. And I would like to thank Dr. Turbulino or Dr. Jacobs to be here today. If not them, I'm not. I was very, really, uh, very busy scheduled to be in uh, around the region, but I did everything to make it to be here today. So it is really my honor to be here today and uh, talk to you future of education. In the age of increasing speed, complexity, uncertainty, and I would even say the Tao of the era of artificial intelligence. Our panel looks at the viewpoints of the diverse area of stakeholders in regards to education. The business, society, government, students, and universities. At first, let us take a look at global trends. According to World Bank Education Statistics, as a percentage of GDP, countries spend an average of 4.77% on primary education. Latin America and Caribbean spends an average of 5.7%, the highest of all of our region spending, which is below 5%. While countries may spend the same percentage of GDP on education, Learning outcomes vary across countries. If some countries have lower learning outcomes in comparison to other countries, we have similar expenditure shares. Therefore, one of the major challenges to tackle is to increase the effectiveness of every dollar spent on education and increase the learning outcomes for the developing states. Another important trend we see today is the fact that it is definitely rewarding to invest in education in terms of socioeconomic effects. While we above said it's true, when developing countries have lesser learning outcomes, it is also true that we private average global rate of return, return to one extra year of schooling is about 9% a year and very stable over decades. Also, social returns to schooling remain high, above 10%, at the secondary and higher education levels. Women continue to experience higher average rates of return to schooling, meaning that girls' education should remain a priority. Returns are higher even in low-income countries as well. Again, if we consider the newest study, a global data set on education quality, reveals important trends. Learning outcomes in developing countries are often at the bottom of the global scale. The top performers often perform worse than the bottom performers in developed countries. 50% of students reach the global minimum threshold of proficiency in developing countries related to 86% in developed countries. Again, this newest global study confirms a positive and significant association between educational achievement and economic growth. Therefore, it is totally clear that there is no alternative to education if we are to have peace and stability in our regions and the world in general. So what are the our major and newer strengths? We may say that we education has turned into a lucrative business for private sector providers. In number of instances, public education has modeled its mission and institutional structures to resemble businesses. 
The key question to consider is whether public sector and private sector compete with each other and how the change in one sector impacts the other. There is also a trend and tendency in modern education in which modern technologies reduce pedagogical interactions and part of this process. For example, in a peer review process or in plagiarism detection, etc. Et, et so certain parts of education are intrinsically reduced to database transactions of information. If we ask ourselves whether this is good, my answer it is excellent, revolutionary, and effective. The possibility to govern and analyze data with the help of technology become increasingly satisfactory and rewarding. It should be imperative to include technology in modern learning. But we must also remain cognizant of possible drawbacks as to where and how this could be problematic. To my understanding, it is also true that technological involvement is by default reductible to limited possibilities. Therefore, I think it is important with human involvement in pedagogical work, involvement of those who are skilled in both old and new avenues, must firmly remain part of education technologies. We can look at big trends in education today and in the near future as well. First, due to technological advancements, students will have more opportunities to learn at different times and different places. For example, we will have of learning tools, flipped classrooms, where theoretical parts will be learned outside of the classroom, and the practical part taught in interactive in class. Bring your own device and blended learning opportunities and hours. Second, again, due to technologies, Teaching can be personalized and students with different abilities thought with harder issues while with advanced with difficulties will have the opportunity to work on achieving the target level. Third, it is almost inevitable when the human involvement in math-based operatives will diminish. Computers will take care of statistical analysis and describe and analyze data and predict future trends. Hence, interpretation of data should become a much more important part of the curriculum of the future. Fourth, students will become more and more involved in shaping the curriculum, but at the same time, with increasing independent study, mentoring will become more important to students' success. We are teachers mainly guide students through with plenty of information around the topic. Even though the changes will be revolutionary in retrospect, the teacher and educational institutions will remain to be vital to good academic performance. And again, while some parts of the world are facing these revolutionary changes, our struggle for equal access, equal treatment, and minimum standards of education, these challenges are well identified by United Nations MDGs. Can we take up the task of property synthesizing the positive developments? I described above and not overlook the challenges but still remain. We certainly must, as there is no substitution for hard work. We must take up small bites and try to work towards achieving inclusive and effective education worldwide. Again, the more critical question is how? We must, the various stakeholders, business, society, government, students, and universities, make our impact wherever we can and whenever we can. In that respect, it is my utmost honor and privilege to represent an organization, a unique network of higher education institutions IAUP, International Association of University Presidents, which stands for improving education standards 
in the world since 1965. Improving quality of education and ensuring access to necessary knowledge is, I must remain you, the fourth United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. One that I believe holds a master key to many of our problems. Hence, I want to focus on how institution I represent has been making its own mark and organizing a multi-stakeholder partnership in education. IAUP today involves and operates around a mission which is to cooperate with one another across borders and to magnify, multiply, and intensify the impact of science-based knowledge for the challenges of the day, like the ones identified by the United Nations, United Nations SDGs. In the past decades, the IUP has developed relationships with the United Nations, making IAUP the lead organization in the development of the United Nations Academic Impact Initiative. The United Nations Academic Impact is an initiative that aligns institutions of higher education, the United Nations, in supporting and contributing to the realization of the United Nations Millennium Challenge Goals. IOP has also developed a unique professional development and mentoring program for newly appointed presidents, rectors, and vice chancellors. IOP has been committed to the protection of scholars threatened by war, terrorism, and political repression, urging IOP members to support the Institute of International Education Scholar Rescue Fund. Moreover, after taking my over my term in office as the president of IEP, we focus on the new agenda innovation in education for a brighter future. To this end, under my presidency, IEP will focus on innovation, innovative higher education capacity building reports in Africa, as well as in conflict and post conflict zones. We look for new ways to advance peace and conflict resolution through higher education, which is the third principle of the United Nations Academic Impact. We dedicate itself to promoting new approaches to intercultural dialogue and understanding and the unlearning of intolerance through higher education, third principle of the United Nations Academic Impact. Work to support the internationalization of higher education by making IUP a platform for development of innovative partnership models. Strive to make the global voice of higher education heard throughout the world by continuing media partnership with such, a, such as the We Wonder World News, by participating in more actively global forums such as the United Nations, and by establishing an IAUP World Education Center to serve as a hub for development and dissemination innovative capacity building ideas for higher education. And this presidency will attract young university leaders full of energy, ideas, and motivation for challenge, change, and give them opportunities to be mentored by veteran leaders who know with ropes and want to give back to the next generation. At the end, in the end, I would like to conclude my, by saying that the IEP work is just but not exactly how leaders can mobilize activities towards a common goal. But these are acts that need to be emulated and repeated in various avenues towards a better vision for the future of our education. Thank you very much.